Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Today I'm starting a three-part series on the state of education in the United States today. Part one today is going to be the broken system. Part two, which should be out tomorrow, will be the results of a broken system. And then part three will be the how to fix the broken system. So to get an idea of just how broken things are and how they got this way, I'm going to read to you a piece from a um, nonfiction work by Robert A. Heinlein called The Happy Days Ahead. Now, to give you an idea <clears throat> of who Robert Heinlein was, Robert Heinlein um, was an American science fiction author. He was also an aeronautical engineer and a retired Navy uh, officer. He is often called the dean of science fiction writers. He was among the first to emphasize uh, scientific accuracy in his science fiction stories and was a pioneer of the subgenre of science fiction that we call hard science fiction. We'll go into that. It's too complicated. Look it up for yourself. And do read the man. He's fracking brilliant. <clears throat> His work uh, often continues to have a uh, influence on both science fiction and in uh, modern cultural more generally. I certainly suggest you read some of what he was written and you will see how it still to this day does in fact influence some of our culture. Now he was also a nonfiction writer. He wrote a lot of nonfiction and that is the emphasis of what I'm going to read to you today. Um, now, so to introduce this to some extent, the, the, this is from his article, The Happy Days Ahead, which was written in 1980. Now, one thing to be aware of with Heinlein is that he was a compulsive newspaper clipper. What you have to understand is prior to the Internet, when we could go out and Google anything that we wanted to, look it up on Wikipedia, whatever, before all of that, you had newspapers. And so what Heinlein would do would be clip newspaper articles on almost any subject and then file them away in actual physical files in physical filing cabinets and he would keep these for decades and decades. So when he came to write The Happy Days Ahead, which is in part about education, he had decades worth of newspaper clippings on the subject to draw from. He could see right in those newspaper clippings what he was talking about and the decline that he was talking about. So The Happy Days Ahead is the story of the decline of education from Heinlein's father's era in the late 1800s until shortly before Heinlein's death in 1988. And it has gotten demonstrably worse since, and I will explain some of the reasons for that after I do the reading of his article. So his article reads, and again, this is me doing a dramatic interpretation of Robert A. Heinlein's work, The Happy Days Ahead. Heinlein said, My father never attended college. He went to high school in a southern Missouri town of about 3,000 plus, and then attended a private two-year academy roughly analogous to a junior college today, except that it was very small. It had to be. It was a day school, and Missouri had no paved roads. Here are some of the subjects that he studied in backcountry 19th century schools. <clears throat> Latin, Greek, physics, at that time called natural philosophy, French algebra, first year calculus, bookkeeping, American uh, history, world history, chemistry, and geology. 28 years later, I, and again we're talking Heinlein here, I attended a much larger city high school. I took Latin and French, but Greek was not offered. I took physics and chemistry, but geology was not offered. I took geometry and algebra, but calculus was not offered. I took American history and ancient history, but no comprehensive co history course was, uh, was offered. Now, anyone who wanted a comprehensive history could take each of these as a five hour a week, one year class, the following possible courses, ancient history, medieval history, modern European history, and American history. And note that all the available courses ignored all of Asia, all of South America, and all of Africa except ancient Egypt, and touched on Canada and Mexico solely with respect to the US wars with each of those countries. I've had time to repair what I missed with a combination of travel and private study. And I must admit that I did not tackle Chinese history in depth until this year. That's 1980. Heinlein was born in the 1920s. My training is in history was so spotty that until I went to the Naval Academy and saw the captured battle flags, I learned that we fought, North, fought Korea some 80 years prior 
to the mess that we are still trying to clean up. This was 1980. Pardon me. This was 1980. 80 years prior to 1980. And we are still today trying to clean up the mess that is North Korea. From my father's textbook, I know that the world history course he studied was not detailed. I mean, how could it be? But at least it revealed, it treated the world itself as round. It did not ignore three-fourths of our planet. Now, let me report what I've seen, heard, looked up, and clipped out of newspapers and elsewhere, and read in books such as Why Johnny Can't Read, Blackboard Jungle, etc., Colorado Springs, our home until 1965, in 1960 offered uh, first year Latin, but that was all. Caesar, uh, Ver Cicero, Virgil, who dat? But Latin is not taught in the high schools of Santa Cruz County. Uh, and from oral reports and clippings, I note that it is not taught in almost any school across the country. Uh, as an aside, my school, 1980, I was getting into high school at that time. We certainly did not offer Latin at that point. The, the uh, attitude then and now is why this emphasis on Latin it is a dead language brother if jazz it with jazz in the words of a great artist if you ain't gonna ask, if you have to ask you ain't never going to know a person who knows only his own language does not even know his own language epistemology necessitates knowing more than one human language and besides that sharp edge latin is a giant help in all the sciences and so is greek so i studied it on my own a friend of mine now a dean in a state university was a tenured professor of history but got rifted when his history was eliminated from the required subjects for a bachelor's degree his courses american history are still offered but the one or two who shows up he tutors because the overheads for a classroom cannot be justified now a recent wall street journal story described that the bloodthirsty job hunting that goes on at the annual meeting of the modern languages association even modern languages even english are being de-emphasized right across the country there are more professors in modern language uh, um, association than there are jobs now i'm not reading this whole article but in part of it, he mentions the straight-A uh, student who went on a scholarship to a uh, local university who did not know the relationships between weeks, months, and years. And this is not uncommon. High school and college students in this country usually can't do simple arith arithmetic without using a pocket calculator. Today it would be your phone. And I mean this would be done with pencil and without pencil and paper, because ask one to do mental arithmetic causes pretty much their jaw to drop. Say you do 17 times 34, done mentally. No paper, no calculator. Well, there's a, way, a couple of ways you can do this. I'm not going to talk about it because it would you probably lose you unless I sat up here and wrote it out. But trust me, there's ways that you can do this in your head. I certainly can. Uh, but not the ways that I line suggested. I, I, do, I do it more um, manually. But... His father, Heinlein's father, would have given the answer at once as his country grammar school a century ago required perfect memorization of multiplication tables through 20 by 20 equaling 400. So his ciphering of that equation would have been merely the doubling of an already known number. And he might have done it again by another route to check it, but the hesitation would have been not noticeable. Now, was my father, again speaking as Heinlein, was my father a mathematician? <laughs> not at all. Am I? Hell no. This is the sort of kitchen arithmetic, the sort that high school students can no longer do, at least in Santa Cruz. And I can tell him as an editorial aside, as someone who was going into high school at the time that he wrote this, it was certainly true that we could not do that without paper or without having some kind of a pocket calculator. Now, if they don't study math and languages and history, what do they study? Now, nota bene, any student can learn the truly tough subjects on any, almost any campus if he or she wants to. The professors and books and labs are all there, but the student must want to. If the student does not want to learn anything requiring brain sweat, most U.S. campuses will babysit him for four years and then hand him a baccalaureate degree for not burning down the library. That girl in college, Colorado Springs who studied Latin but 
classic Latin, not does no classic Latin rather, got a general bachelor's degree at the University of Colorado in 1964. I attended her graduation, asked what she had majored in. No major. What had she studied? Nothing, as it turned out. And sure enough, she's as ignorant today as she was when she left high school. Santa Cruz has an enormous, lavish two-year college in a campus of the University of California. Degrees granting through PhD level. But since math and languages and history are not required, let's see how they fill the other classrooms. Now, the University of California, all of its campuses, and again, this was 1980, things have changed since then, is classed as a tough school. It is paralleled by a state university system with lower entrance requirements, and this is paralleled by local junior colleges, never called junior, that accept any warm body. Now, UCSC was planned as an elite school, quote, the Oxford of the West, unquote, but failing enrollment, falling enrollment rather, made it necessary to for accept any applicant for who can qualify for the University of California as a whole. Therefore, UCSC now typifies the statewide campus. Entrance can by, be made by examination, usually the college entrance examination boards or by high school certificate, that is, you graduated high school. Either way, admission requires a certain spread. You have to have two years of math, two years of a modern language, one year of natural sciences, one of American history, three years of English, at a level all across the board that balances out to a B plus. There are also two additional requirements, English composition and American history and institutions. The second requirement acknowledges that some high schools do not require American history, that is all high schools today. UCSC permits, permits an otherwise uh, acceptable applicant to make up this deficiency with credit after admis admission. Now, the first additional requirement, English composition, can be met by a written examination. Um, and uh, this would, uh, uh, this would be, can be accomplished with something called the CEEB at that time. I don't know what that was. Or by transferring college credits, considered equivalents, or lacking either of these by passing an examination uh, at UCSC at the start of any given quarter. The above looks Midland good on the surface. College and requirements from high school have been watered down somewhat, or more than somewhat, but the B plus average looks as a requirement looks good if the high schools are teaching what they taught two or three generations ago. The rule uh, li rules limit, administri limit admission to the upper 8% of California high school graduates. This was in 1980. Out-of-state applicants have to have a slightly higher requirements, but this is 8%, 8%, so 92% of people in California would fall by the wayside. They would not be allowed to attend. That's in 1980. These 8% are the intellectual elite of young adults of the biggest, richest, and most lavishly educated state in the union. Those, exa those examinations for the, mo for the English composition requirement, how, how, can how can one fail that? who has had three years of high school English and averages B plus across the board. If he fails to qualify, well, he may enter, but he has to take it le at once, immediately, for credit, subject A, otherwise known as bonehead English. Now, bonehead English must be repeated, if necessary, until it is passed. To be forced to take this no credit course does not mean that the victim splits the occasional infinitive or sometimes has a dangling modifier or has a failure in agreement or case. He can even get away with such atrocities as, like I say, it means that he has reached the groves of academe unable to express himself by writ writing in the English language. It means that his command of, the na of his native language does not equal that of a 12-year-old country grammar school graduate of 90 years ago. That was in 1980. It means that he verges on the subliterate, but that his record is such in other ways that the university virtually will tutor him, no credit, and for a fee, rather than turn him away. But since these students are the upper 8% and each has had not less than three years of high school edu English, it follows that only the exceptionally unfortunate student needs bonehead English. I mean, that's right, isn't it? Each is 18 years or old. They are old enough to vote, old enough to 
contract to marry without consulting their parents, old enough to hang for murder, old enough to have children, and some of them do, all had 12 years of schooling, including 11 years of English, three of them in high school, now stipulated, and this was in 1980, so it's pretty much across the board in the entire country for this. It's stipulated, California has special cases to whom English is not a na native language, but such a person who winds up in that upper 8% is usually, and I'm tempted to say always, fully literate in English. So here we have the cream of California's young adults. Each has learned to read and write and spell, and each has been taught the basics of English during eight years in grammar school, and has polished this by not less than three years of English in high school, and has had at least two years of a second language, a drill that vastly illuminates the subject of grammar, even through the grasp of the second language, may be imperfect. Now it stands to reason that very few applicants need bonehead English, yes? Nope. I just checked. This is 1988. The new class at UCSC is about 50% in bonehead English, and this is normal across the board in California, and California is no worse than most of the states. 8% off the top, half of that 8% must take bonehead English. The prosecution rests. This scandal must be charged to grammar and high school teachers, many of whom are themselves illiterate. I know, and so do I personally. But they are not to blame because we are now in the second generation of illiteracy. The blind lead the blind. And that is what the master, Robert A. Heinlein, had to say in 1980. That was 1980. Things have gotten significantly worse. Now, I can tell you how this happened. How this happened over a course of a period of time was really very simple. Very, very simple. You start out about 100 so years ago, and you have a level of education necessary for a teacher up here someplace, right? They have to be this educated. But then they said to themselves, why are we keeping things like, I don't know, um, Latin? around. That, that's a dead language. We don't need to teach that. So the next generation didn't learn as much as this generation. So now you have this generation and they are this educated. And they say things like, well, why are we having that all that, you know, really advanced mathematics? That's really not necessary. Let's cut that out. So the next generation learned that much. Remember, we started up here. We're now down here. And the next generation took things out of the curriculum. And the next generation took things out of the curriculum. And eventually we're down here, which is where we are now where we have essentially illiterate teachers. We have teachers who themselves know nothing and so therefore cannot teach anything to anyone. Now in terms of my own experience, oh boy, I uh, have been around education most of my life for a variety of reasons and at one point I felt to some extent, it was my duty to start giving back after having spent quite a number of years in IT. I thought it was my duty to sort of give back and uh, start teaching myself. So I taught for three years at a junior college. Now, I usually refer to this place for reasons that will become obvious in a moment as the place that shall not be named. But I'm going to name it today. That place was the late and thoroughly unlamented ITT Technical Institute. Now, I want you to know that while teaching there, I was rather slapped in the face with a very obvious problem that got me in trouble with the college itself. Because, oh man, ITT Tech, if you know much about it, was a degree factory. It would accept anyone, whether they were capable of passing a course or not. It would uh, pass anyone, whether or not they'd really done the work. And then it would get them through based on a nice fat student loan that was operated by a sister company of theirs. Now be aware that I did not know, I honestly did not know most of these places' business practices until shortly before they canned me, and by the time they did can me, I was happy to be going. But I got in a lot of hot water. I was denied at least one promotion because of it, because I graded for real. I didn't play their ball. I graded honestly. If you had me as an instructor any time that I was working there, it doesn't matter if what people say about your degree says it's worthless. I will personally vouch for you because I flunked out as the only um, full-time IT instructor at that campus. I flunked out 90% of the people who came in. 
we would get any at any given time we would get say a new class of uh, about 90 people in the IT department by the time graduation came around maybe nine or eight of them were graduating I flunked them because they couldn't read because they were not capable of doing the work and boy did I get in trouble for that but our schools are churning out illiterate ignorami as an example of some things that I can talk about I'm not being hyperbolic here I'm really not I when I say literally when I say literally about something I'm not using that as something like oh I literally have no money or something like that I mean actual literate I mean when I say literally I mean that it literally is true something is actually literally true we have an entire generation and well into our second that can neither read nor write nor perform the most basic math some of the things that I always like to mention at ITT Tech when I work there, um, probably the most memorable thing in terms of what I personally saw, I was tutoring a student, uh, and uh, first thing that happened was, of course, that student hadn't brought their book to the tutoring session, which required me to go to my office and then get the book. So I said to the student, okay, well, um, where do where you get lost? Where'd you get lost? Let's uh, you know, start out where you got lost. It was week 11 of a 12-week course, and the student pulled out all 11 weeks worth of unfinished work. They had never started even on week one. Now, with anyone with a brain, you know that this is, it's over. They're never going to pass. But as an instructor, you feel, okay, I have to give it at least my best try. So I said, all right, well, why don't you uh, turn to the page in the book that's referenced here in your paper, and we'll get started. And the student kind of looked at me with like a deer in the headlights. So I flipped over to the page and the student went, I swear to God, this is what said. How did you know what page to turn to? Now, instructors, we really do live. We really live for this moment. You know, when we've done something right, we feel I've done our jobs because there's a light bulb that goes on over a student's head. You know, they say, oh, I get it now. I get something that I didn't get before. And we go pat ourselves on the back and go, ah, we did our job right. Here the light came on when the student realized that books have page numbers. This was the first time in 12 years of compulsory education that this student had ever cracked a book. The student also wanted to know how they were supposed to know all this information about how to do the homework and all that. And I said, well, uh, you read the book. You know, it says in the assignments what, book to, what part pages in the book and what book to read for any given uh, upcoming uh, class and you do the homework and you take notes in class and the student was utterly crestfallen and I knew why because the student not only couldn't read she couldn't write that's one of my more obvious ones there were students I knew who had could not tell the difference between the words Linux L-I-N-U-X and Linksys L-I-N-K-S-Y-S I frequently got in uh, research papers that were one page long one I'm sorry one page one sentence long the worst of these I hung up on my um, office wall at one point it was about six sentence six words all of which were misspelled there was no punctuation no capitalization and that's what they thought counted as a research paper. But the most famous incident that happened there, and anyone who happened to be at that particular campus at that particular time will know exactly what I'm talking about. The most famous incident happened when a student in his essentially remedial math class got into a giant stinking row with his uh, PhD level math instructor a guy who was doing this for kicks because he was a math geek he got into it with him the division by zero was possible now if any of you know anything about mathematics it is a given that you cannot to divide by zero it's simply impossible but the student started screaming yelling stormed out of the classroom went straight to administration and attempted to file a grievance against this instructor on the basis that the instructor was anti-semitic the Jewish the student being Jewish fortunately and unknown to the student the instructor was Jewish as well so that didn't fly those are some of the most common things we have students now routinely our institutions are turning out complete illiterates who can neither read nor write nor perform the most basic math and so that's all I have to really say about that for today so thank you for watching 
Uh, again, this is a three-part series. Part two tomorrow is going to be results of the broken system, followed by part three, fixing the broken system. So if you liked what I'm doing, please do like, sub, hit the notification bell, and to tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, and pets to do the livestock to do the same, and um, share me on social media. I would certainly appreciate your support via subscribe star, PayPal tip jar, or a place on my website where you can support me further, and all of these are listed in my description box below. So thanks for watching Tales from SYL Ranch, and remember, for a breath of fresh air, watch Tales from SYL Ranch. News, commentary from the heartland, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.